Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the perfect talk with Dr. Sami. This is the platform where demand and supply of information and knowledge in the field of agriculture meet. Um, we use that platform to bridge the knowledge gap. You know, on one hand, there is a lot of, you know, opportunities and knowledge. On the other hand, there are people who lack knowledge and opportunities. So we use this platform to bridge that gap. I always say that PERFECT is an acronym for policies, education, research, farming and finance, extension and advisory services, communications, including issues around knowledge management, monitoring and evaluation, but also the T stands for technologies and trade. If you see here, these opportunities happen at different levels, at local level, national level, regional level, continental level, and global level. Today, we are talking perfect policies. We are talking about the policy space, and I have in our midst a very, very exciting and powerful woman who has been working in the policy space for many years now. Ladies and gentlemen, let me present to you Bibi Kiyose. She works a lot in the policy space, but she will tell us more about who she is. Bibi, welcome to the perfect talk with Dr. Sami. And today we are talking policies. Who is Bibi Kiyose? Thank you very much, Sami, for the opportunity. Bibi Kiyose, otherwise my full name is Bitsepo. Bitsepo. We say, but you know, the one who trusts herself. Absolutely. Absolutely. The one, okay. who trusted, the okay. one who's trustworthy and the one who's holy at the same time. Okay. So, Bibi Kiyose is a, an international nutritionist by training okay. from the US, from yes. Cornell. Yes. Um, I have studied um, exactly that, you know, with uh, food security, uh, epidemiology, okay. biology, chemistry, you name it. Okay. And I have worked at different levels. And it's interesting that, you know, perfect model, yes. you actually indicate the different levels. Yes. I worked at local level in terms of working for my government. Of Canada, yes. Then I worked at regional level working for the Commonwealth Regional Health. Yes. I worked for NEPAD, worked for the UN before. Yes. Now I'm actually working for the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Yes. As a senior policy program officer okay. in nutrition and food security. So you, yes. Okay, so you came to the agriculture through the nutrition pathway. Exactly. We have some commonalities there. Did you know that uh, my master's is actually in community nutrition? I remember, I remember that. Yes. <laughs> yes, because people who are studying nutrition, for example, they don't see themselves working no. in agriculture. And here you are, you, you never studied agriculture per se, no, but you, you, no. you had your qualification in nutrition, but here Absolutely. you are, you are working in the agricultural sector. How exciting. Please tell me more about no, that. No, because it is very, for me, it is for me, a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. You cannot have nutrition without food. But people have this tendency of separating okay. agriculture and nutrition. Thank you. So for me, it's a continuum. Yes. It's a very obvious path. You need food in a very balanced format. Yes. You need diversity. Yes. Of food to provide you with all the nutrients okay. that you need. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. unfortunately, mm -hmm. nutrition has always been looked at from a health and medicalized perspective. But you see, by the time you go to the hospital, the damage is already done. You could prevent all the issues from an agriculture provision point of view. So this is where I encourage policy mm -hmm. to start from that end. I see. So you're actually marrying the nutrition and agriculture from the policy level to say, hey, okay. let us look at this thing not in isolation. Let us start a conversation. Let, let okay. us start a functional marriage of the two. Okay. Okay. This is very you exciting. You can't one without the other. Okay. 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 No, I'm, I'm hearing that. So you are actually even encouraging the people who are in agriculture. You can't think agriculture without thinking of the nutrition aspect. You see, I always insist 
Mm -hmm. I don't care what mm -hmm. I always insist that the whole purpose why agriculture exists is not just to feed people, but to nourish people. So if you do agriculture without that end point in mind, you are missing your uh, whole bucket okay. load of the whole logic. Okay, so you are actually, you remind me, because I also teach a lot on issues of food security. I know the definition of food security with the United Nations. They look at, you know, four things. They look at the issues of access, the mm -hmm. availability, but yeah. the utilization, which brings the nutritional aspect of it Absolutely. and the sustainability. So, so this is what you are promoting and, and in a very sensible manner. Exactly. And now, mm -hmm. the new thinking, which has uh, come of late, unfortunately, yes. is that of really focusing on the consumer. And now this is why we talk about food systems. Thank you. I know it's about a system mm -hmm. that starts with you know, from the research, from the seeds, yes. or from the animal, yes. or from the forest, or yes. from the water, yes, all the way to the table. Okay, and it's about how the food system actually should influence, or how the consumer mm -hmm. can influence the food system. And we see that happening, especially in you know other developed countries where. The farmer does not define what they produce, what but produced? the consumer is the, the one consumer. who's influencing. Absolutely. Yes, that's yes. the way and it I, should be. Yeah, and I would like to see that in Africa as well, because you know, yeah. more and more we see people, consumers wanting to know how the pro the food is produced, and really yeah. understand that because at the end of the day, they are the ones who are either benefiting from the food, or they mm -hmm. are being affected by the food. Is that, you know, the whole conversation? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, beauty. Yeah. I always tell people that there is a huge uh, opportunity pathway into agriculture through the policy space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know you are working in that space. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more how the agriculture policy is organized, you know, globally? You mm -hmm. know, yeah. Okay. Um, let me start. Okay. Let me start from the model that you projected. Yes. If you look at local, yes. How are farmers and capital do? Mm -hmm. Why are they producing what they are producing? Yes. That uh, directly taps into the local and national policy space. Thank you. What are governments actually encouraging the farmers to to produce? Yes. What drives them? Yes. You see, now this is where I I am very conflicted because. Unfortunately, still in Africa, the agriculture policies are not driven by the nutritional outcomes. Okay. The policies are driven by the economic, economic outcome. Yes. And also, unfortunately, the policies are driven not necessarily by local markets, but by external markets. Thank you. So you find that mm -hmm. the way the policies are structured, mm -hmm are centered around only a few crops and a few animal products. Yes. Very, very limited. Yes. When you look at most of our policies in Africa, mm -hmm. you don't get much emphasis around horticulture products, for instance. Yes. Your fruit, your vegetable, your even wild products, I mean, even fish itself. So yes. it's focusing mainly on cash crops. I hear you. On staple crops. I hear you. And so people are producing, but the very producers are the most malnourished. Thank How you. How do you do it? Thank you. I know, especially like the country like South Africa, we mm. statistics show us that we are food secured at national level. At national but level, but at household level, we are not. Yeah. And I think this is the paradox that we are looking yeah. at. And in yeah. terms of, you know, um, export and all that, we... we I was, I was looking what? at, you know, the statistics were yeah. probably rated, you know, maybe the 30, 33 or the 33rd country in terms of, you know, yeah. the GDP and all that. But and on the other was, hand, yeah. we still have a lot of people who are malnourished. Manga and malnutrition. Okay. Manga and malnutrition. Okay. So when we so talk... that's we, one part of it. Yes. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. one part of it. Let me just complete this mm -hmm. here. Okay. So mm -hmm. that I nest my thinking mm -hmm. and upgrade it to... So, mm. at continental level, 
Reginald. Uh, Reginald. Let's you start know, from Regi. The Reginald. You skip the regional part. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so we have the national level. Mm -hmm. Then we have the regional level. Mm -hmm. uh, in Africa, we have um, eight regional economic communities that are recognized. Yes. By the African Union. Yes. So in the Southern African region, we have SADC. SADC. Yes. And you may wish to recall that back in the days when SADC was, um, when SADC started, mm -hmm. we had the food security unit I see. hosted in Zimbabwe. Yes. In Harare. Mm -hmm. And when they decided to centralize the functions of SADC, mm -hmm. everything was to put to for the regional office. To yes. Mm -hmm. Now, from the regional economic communities that has, uh, that have their own uh, regional policies mm -hmm. on agriculture and food security. Mm -hmm. We now graduate up to continental level. Yes. And the driving force in terms of the policy mm -hmm. for the continent yes. is what is called the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, otherwise ADAP. known as ADAP. For yes. Sure. yes. ADAP was succeeded to as uh, the Maputo Declaration in 2003. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it has since been adopted by all countries. Mm -hmm. So countries have developed what are called CADAP compacts. Yes. So a CADAP compact is basically a national driving instrument, policy mm -hmm. instrument. Yes. To drive the country. Yes. Yeah. What the country should be producing, where the gaps are, how do you, how do you fill those gaps? Yeah. Looking at the variety yes. of our property. Okay. Approach um, and implementation. Yes. As can be the case, as you know, mm -hmm. the first uh, set of uh, cut up uh, compacts, mm -hmm. they did not have nutrition protection well. I hear you. Then comes on board Bibi Giosi, mm -hmm. a senior advisor to nutrition yes. at Nepal. Yes. What with all my mind and body, soul, everything. I remember. I remember that's when we met, actually, when you were yes. still, you know, <laughs> heading the, the cut up pillar. Pillar yes, 3, I think it was at that time. Three. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So for tooth and nail, to make sure that nutrition is well articulated mm -hmm. within the cut up, mm -hmm. and then well articulated within the national policies, and thank God to this day, yes. this nutrition has been elevated mm -hmm. from a policy point of view and from a programmatic point of view. Yes. Now people are talking more and more nutrition and food systems okay. in Canada. Yes. Well, Bibi, you know, when I talk to people, you talk about CADEP, which is more at a continental level. When I talk, peop when I talk to people, they still this notion that uh, that is something, you know, it's CADEP, it's NEPAT, it's up there. And what I tell people is that there is no continent without countries. You know, con continent is abstract. Region is abstract. You yourself... You, you were not born in the continent. You come from no, a country. Come from, absolutely. I come exactly. from a village for crying out loud. Exactly. You are coming from a country. So any role that anyone plays at continental level, it comes from different countries. And this is where I say it is an opportunity. It means that the position that you hold there, it could have been a position for anyone from all the 50, 55 absolutely. countries. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, the yes. opportunities are open. People mm -hmm. just have to be on the lookout for them. Yes. But we, as the high-level technical people, yes. we have to be out there to encourage the youth to engage in okay. agriculture. Okay. And how do you do that? We do what, that. What, I mean, what, yeah. um, yes. mm -hmm. what are those opportunities okay. for youth to engage? From, yeah. very, from various angles. I'm working with um, a an organization called uh, Yali. Yali, Yali, Youth okay. Yeah. Yes. Youth for Agriculture. Yes. yes. So Yali uh, is about engaging the youth okay. to take advantage of that. So they have uh, trainings. Well, thanks to COVID, now they can't have face-to-face. -face. Yes. But they have regular trainings. Yes. And then they look for opportunities and they connect. They connect the youth to these opportunities to say, look, Within the United Nations, this is where you can go. Within, um, you know, the sub-regional organizations, this is yes. what you can do, where you can go. Okay. Within your own countries, these are some of the, the agencies and the yes. organizations that you can do. Okay. Because, you see, um, who are the farmers today? Who are the producers? 
of yes. the city. Mm. Most of them are the elders. Yes. When they go, they are going with that knowledge. Mm -hmm. So how do you encourage that knowledge to be passed down? Yes. And when I talk about knowledge, I'm not talking about uh, necessarily book knowledge. I'm also wanting to look at the indigenous yes. traditional knowledge systems. Yes. That are so valuable. Yes. Because now we recognize that with climate change, mm -hmm. with environmental degradation, mm -hmm. we have to read this our you. own systems. Yes. So we want the youth to be fully aware of this together with the modern science knowledge. Exactly. And what you are saying is very, very crucial because I remember last year, you know, I'm involved with the private sector mechanism that is engaging with the, uh, the World Committee on Food Security. So last mm -hmm. year, I actually led the delegation of private sector when they were doing some regional consultation for the voluntary guidelines that will be launched right. so, yeah. in, in, yeah. in October. So one yeah. of the key messages that came out in terms of us to mitigate against climate change was to sure. say Africa, it's actually, you know, the food systems of mm. Africa, it's still seen as the best in terms of, mm. you know, mitigating against climate change, yeah. but also the nutrition mm -hmm. rich mm -hmm. yeah. the yeah. of, you know, the food. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So we will see in the next 10 years or so where we are promoting the indigenous food system because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's good in terms of nutrition, but also mm -hmm. it's good in terms of, you know, mitigating against, you know, climate change. No, you it's well suited for the climatic, for the yes. ecological goals. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Oh, so I know you also work with FAO, which is a food and agriculture okay. organization that is working mm -hmm. at the global level. The global level. Yeah. Indeed. Say something a little bit about that. Yeah. The food and agriculture organization, and people may not uh, actually realize or fully appreciate the history of the food and agriculture organization. Yes. FAO actually precedes the United Nations as we know it. Yes. Yes. FAO was the first organization mm -hmm. set up at global level yes. to mitigate post uh, world wars, yes. to mitigate against hunger and starvation. In 1945, I know. In it was, yeah, yeah, in 1945, yes. We are, 45, we are 75 so Yes, exactly. So, FAO was set up uh, with that mindset. But interestingly, mm -hmm. the constitution of FAO, mm -hmm. the first line of FAO's yes. session yes. is to raise levels of nutrition. Ah, uh, I see. Something that people skipped. Everybody okay. seems to have skipped that first line. Yes. That talks about raising levels of nutrition. Of nutrition, yes. And then they went and focused more on the production and productivity. I hear you. I hear you. So, FAO works, I mean, as you rightfully pointed out, mm -hmm. it's a global organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it has uh, several departments and yes. divisions. Yes. One of which is uh, nutrition. Yes. And nutrition is sort of the glue that brings all the different departments together. I hear because you. Because you cannot handle nutrition in isolation. Thank you. So I hope when we break the silos, yes. the same as mm -hmm. and try to escalate or cascade that message yeah. all the way to the national level. People understand that nutrition is a multisexual, interdisciplinary, inter interrelated subject. Yes, yes. You know what? Actually, you are putting it nicely because I can imagine those people who have studied nutrition who never saw themselves playing a role in the agricultural sector are beginning to think, to okay, yeah. how do I actually, you know, bring myself, you know, to play a role in the agricultural sector? Yes. Fast Thank forward. I know we might not have all the time to share yes. all your knowledge and all that. Fast forward. We are in the COVID, you know, um, uh, era, so yes. to say. Hmm. What we are seeing is that nutrition plays a significant role in terms Very of, you know, the resilience of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how, how do you see it? Yes. Well, I mean, it's always been the alpha and the omega, whether people want to believe that or not. Yes. So COVID started uh, back in February when it was um, announced, mm -hmm. you know, for Africa. Mm -hmm. I was one of the first people to write a paper on COVID and nutrition. Okay. So in this paper, just to give you in a nutshell, 
I mean, yes. what uh, COVID and nutrition relate, yes. how COVID and nutrition relate. Yes. So in my paper, mm-hmm. in this paper, I, I articulate that there are going to be four direct impacts. Okay. Okay? Yes. So the first one, since people are being laid off, there's economic uh, stress, financial yes. stress, mm-hmm. people are going to be start, starting. People are going to be hungry. That's true. Yep. So people are going to be losing weight. Yes. Whether they like it or not. That's yes. one part. Yes. But the second part, and a very, I mean, one that, I mean, has always been there. Mm-hmm. I mean, in terms of uh, financial stress, mm-hmm. the first thing that leaves the food basket yes. are the nutritious foods. Uh-huh. Yeah. So fruits, vegetables, and protein sources are going to be leaving the basket. Yes. So people are going to be having more micronutrient deficiencies, which, re- which reduces their resilience and resistance yes. to infection. Ooh. And to me, yeah. And the third thing, because of the lockdown, mm-hmm. energy input versus energy output yes. imbalance. People are not exercising. So yes. weight gain leading to an exacerbation of non communicable diseases, wow. which is a comorbidity. Yes. Comorbidity. Yes. For, for COVID. Oof. Yeah, I see, I see the connections. I see the connections. You know, it's all systemic and, you know. It's a systemic thing. Yeah. And then, last but not least, because people are frustrated, they don't know what tomorrow brings, they don't know how long this thing is there. I mean, they, they can never be a vaccine for a virus, I'm sorry to say. Yes. It's as simple as that. You can't yes. have a vaccine for a virus. Yes. Because the virus is constantly moving. Yes. So because of the situation, the uncertainty. Yes. And because the way the all systems are shaken and broken. Yes. Mental illness. Wow. On the rise. Okay. Depression, anxiety, suicide. I hear you. I hear you. You know, at this Gender-based violence in South Africa. We exactly. we had those statistics yes. as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. No, it increased because yes. of the frustration. I mean, I hear so you. I so in this case, my conclusion is: look, we need to have a very systematic and systemic approach to the policy space yes. because think about it. Right now, there's so much disruption across all systems. Yes. Kids are not going to school. Yes. Parents are having to play multiple roles. Yes. Suddenly, you are the teacher. You are the mom. Homeschooling, yes. Mm-hmm. You are the, I mean, the psychologist, all these things. Yes. So people now have to be thinking about multitasking in a real sense of the word. I hear you. Most of which people are not prepared to do. Yes. So we learn as we do. Exactly. We as we do. And, and, and the other thing that we didn't touch especially when you talk about nutrition and food security, is the whole issue of the double, the double burden of malnutrition. I call it the triple burden. The triple burden, okay. The triple burden. Yes. The triple burden meaning you have undernutrition, which is um, stunting and yes. wasting. Yes. So children being short for their age and children being rather thin for their age and height. Yes. Then you have micronutrient. I hear, I hear you. And obesity. You, Yes, African diets are still very much uh, carbohydrate starch based. I hear you. We are not getting enough of high nutrient dense foods okay. from fruits and vegetables and nuts. And yes, yes. And then the third thing, third, you know, burden is overweight and obesity. Yes. Resulting in uncommunicable diseases. Exactly. And and sometimes you find all that in one household. And, and and sometimes in one person, interestingly. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not so much in one person, but at least two of them. Yes, I know. Two yeah. of them in one person. Yeah. Exactly. At least two of them in one person. Okay. So why not? Because, the most, of the, because most of the overweight people in mm-hmm. South Africa by the way, mm-hmm. uh, has one of the highest obesity rates. Yes. Outside of the United States. The United States. Yes, exactly. So I think uh, that yeah. sure that about sixty percent of women in South Africa are, are overweight yes. and obese, and and that is an issue. So, so Bibi, the other thing that I'm promoting, you know, with the perfect opportunities and all that, I still believe that some of the solutions are in our hands. 
going forward, we need to promote, you know, local production, you know, mm. of vegetables and, 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 and that can also be done in a very micro backyard, micro you know, but yeah, micro level backyard garden yeah. and all that. And I think that yeah. is doable, right? No, it is very doable. It is very yes. doable. Okay. The thing is, uh, and this is one thing that um, COVID has actually taught us. Yes. Because we realize that outside of what we think we could rely on, mm-hmm. meaning being able to go to a supermarket to spa, yes. to, now people are realizing, you know what, if I don't have the money or if I'm under lockdown, I don't have that opportunity. Yes. And the best thing is to now grow my own patch okay. of vegetables. Yes. Exactly. So now that takes me also, it completes the, the loop when I was talking about indigenous and homegrown solutions. Thank you. So one of the things that I'm promoting, and I know some people might think I'm crazy, but I think it's doable. We are looking at the agenda 2030. So I'm saying mm-hmm. in the next 10 years, what I would like to see is 30 million households in Africa that are food okay. secured. Absolutely. 30 million hectares of, you know, mm-hmm. sustainably produced, you know, cultivated, you know, uh, land and all that. And 30 mm-hmm. million schools, 30 million mm-hmm. churches, if we have that, you know, really yeah. taking the mm-hmm. issues of zero hunger to, to, to heart, to the next level. you know, yeah. we're having, you know, some, you know, uh, you know, from ground, bottom up, you know, approach. And I think if everybody, everybody who's listening, everybody can actually apply their mind, we can be able to achieve that. I believe that. No, it is very, it's very simple. I think the only thing that stands between that mm-hmm. and the realization, the success of it is our own minds. Thank you. Thank you. It's so it's our own mind. Okay. So BB, I'm sure I will invite you again. My time is actually, um, you know, against, <laughs> but I'm sure I can invite you again so that, Absolutely. you know, especially if people have more information or maybe more need for, for information yeah. and all that so that we can share right. this. Yeah. Because if Absolutely. we can all mobilize, we can yeah. all mobilize and everybody do something in your little corner, we can yeah. be able to beat, you know, the hunger. We can Absolutely. be able to have, you know, people food secured. Every little action coalesces into this. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we have time for for today. I hope you enjoyed the session. Please, you know where to subscribe, follow us on social media, and I'll be sharing more information about BB and where you can find her, especially uh, the programs that, you know, she's running uh, at NEPAD and CADEP so that you can get more information. We always say knowledge is power. We will see you next time and God bless. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much.